Unless you're very new to C-sharp, you've almost certainly worked with null. In some ways, it can seem very easy to understand. However, there's a lot more depth to working with null than it first seems. In this video, we're gonna look at how to properly work with null in C-sharp. That includes nullable value types, nullable reference types, null conditional operators, no null coalescing operators, no coalescing assignment operators, null annotation context, nullable directives, and the null forgiving operator, and more. That's a lot of stuff to help us work with null. So let's see how many of those features you know how to use. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Cord, and it's my goal to make learning C Sharp easier. I do that by providing videos here on YouTube multiple times per week. Plus, I have a weekly podcast. I also provide courses on C Sharp, web development, and much more at IamTimCorey.com. The profits from those sales are what pays for the free content here on YouTube so that everyone can have a great education in C Sharp, not just those who can afford it. Now, in this video, as with most of my videos, I'm going to create some source code. If you'd like a copy of my source code, use the link in the description. All right, let's go to Visual Studio and we're gonna create a new project. All right, keep it simple. Just do a console app because the point is not to focus in on which project type it is, but on how null works in C Sharp. So let's call this our null demo and our null demo app. Hit next. And we are going to use .NET 6, and this is important because some of the features we're going to use in this demo will be features that are pretty new to C Sharp. In fact, uh, C Sharp 9, I believe, uh, was the latest changes. There might be a couple of tweaks from 10, but I don't think so. Um, but we'll definitely need the latest version. So if you're on, for example, .NET Framework, some of these won't apply. In fact, a lot of these won't apply. And if you are an older version of .NET, some of these might not apply as well, but we'll talk about that as we go. So once we get started, one of the things that we're gonna talk about is the defaults in the project. I'm gonna wait to do that. So let's get rid of the sample right here and we'll just get a couple of blank lines. So what is null? Well, null is an absence of a value. So there is a potential for some things to have a state that is not set or has no value, has an absence of a value. If we look at value types, so for example, an integer, if I say int i, the default value for an integer would be zero. So that's the default value that I wouldn't even have to assign. Now, I do any more because, and we'll get into that, but because of the fact that um, it's by default not nullable. But it still wants us to assign initial value to it. But we could use this potentially because of the fact that it does have a zero for value. Now I've assigned it automatic or manually, but the default, when we don't have a value in an integer, the default value it puts in is zero, all right? However, this is a value type. Value types, since I believe C-sharp 2, have had the opportunity to put a question mark at the end. And this question mark, it makes the value type nullable. So this is saying this is a, uh, a nullable value type. And what that means is that I can say null. And that is the default value for our integer if we don't assign a value is now null because of the question mark. So this adds an extra potential state of null. Now, if I were to take the question mark off, that's gonna give you an error because it says, hey, you cannot convert an int uh, or null to int because it's a non-nullable value type. So the question mark says, well, actually you can put a null in this variable. Now, because it's a value type, this does change what this is. So there's a normal system32 dot integer. Um, I'm sorry, system dot int32, sorry. Um, but with a nullable int, that's a different type. Now it's still an integer, but it's a nullable integer. And so it actually changes behind the scenes the type for us. Um, obviously we're, we're declaring it as a little different, but 
is making a difference. Now, that's important because we get into things called reference types. Now, a reference type can be a string. So string, uh, let's call it S, and by default, I can, the default value for a string is null. That's, I'm just specifying it here, but that's the default, all right? But notice there's no question mark here, okay? That's because reference types are already nullable. So another option for this, let's add a class here. So we'll add a class, we'll call it uh, person model. And let's clean this up a little bit. There we go, make it public just because I like to see them public. And we're gonna do an int ID and we're gonna do a string name is fine. And uh, let's do one more um, uh, Boolean and we'll say um, is, is valid, how about that? So by default, Boolean is set to false. Okay, an integer is set to zero and a string is set to null. Those are the default values. So notice I had to mark the value type as nullable in order to put a null into it, but with string, I do not. And the same is true if I were to say person model, which control dot to add that using statement, person model P equals new. Okay, so this, if I didn't say equals new, I could say equals no. And that fits just fine. All right, so I can put a null value into P and by default, that's what the value would be of type P. So this P right here, the person model, is a, a, a reference type. Now, if you're not familiar with the difference between reference type and value type is, we can go all the way down the rabbit hole, but I keep it really simple and at the surface here. Um, so value types, here's the practical difference when it comes to using them. If I were to say, um, let's just set I, well, let's, let's do a demo down below. We're not messing with what we have so far. So if I were to say int j equals five, and I were to say int int k equals j, all right? And then we're gonna set j equal to 10. Now, do you know what the value of k will be? Well, it's gonna be five because j equals five, put the value of five into k, but notice I set the value of j equal to 10. It didn't change the value of k because what happened was this five value was copied from J over to K, all right? So when we use value types and pass them around, we pass a copy of the value. So K is now five and J equals 10. That's a value type. Now, if I were to, let's do this. Um, person model, uh, test one equals new. I would say person model uh, test two equals test one. All right. And let's, let's actually set the value of test one dot name equal to Tim. And now I would change the value of test one dot name equal to Sue. What's the value of test two dot name? Well, let's just show you here. Console write line test one dot name, and we'll do console write line test two dot name. Okay, we're gonna show both of these names. Let's run this. And we get a value of Sue for both of them. But why is that? Because I copied test one, after I changed test one's name to Tim, I put that value in a test two, right? Well, no, I didn't put the value, I put the reference. So the this points to a certain address in memory. This now has that same reference. 
So think of it like a uh, we built a house when we said new. And so we built a house. We got the house's address, 123 Sesame Street. And then we built another house and we said, hey, that address is actually the address of the first house, which is 123 Sesame Street. Now you both have the same address. So that when we go in the front door and sit in the living room, changing the name here, that's what we're doing. Um, we change it for both of those. They both refer back to the same address, the same location. That's a reference type. Okay. So now that you know that, let's talk through these reference types here. So we've seen that we have this P, which is null, and it can be null even without being marked as nullable. All right. Because by default, we can say it's not pointing to any specific reference. It's not any specific address in memory. It just is. It's just it's waiting for that address in memory. And that's where that equals new comes in. So by default, reference types like person model and string, they refer back to a, a null value by default. So we've already had this. this. This came out of the box with original C sharp, but with C sharp eight, we started to say, hey, you know what? That might be kind of problematic because we don't know if if this value is going to be null or not. And let's create some kind of syntax around this that will help the compiler know and help warn us when we're using a value that might be null. And that's where we have this concept of the nullable annotation context. Okay. And that's a big word, but what, or big phrase, what that is, if you go to the project and look at right here, line seven in .NET six and beyond projects, they're new. We have this by default. Nullable is enabled. All right. Now, if you're in a .NET five project or before, then you will not have this turned on by default. It will be disabled or not existent. If it's not existent, it's disabled. But for new projects only, in .NET 6 going forward, it will be on by default. And what this does, it allows us to know more context in the design time so that the editor can warn us about potential issues with our, our variables, where it says, hey, you know what? You might be using something that could be null. And we can hopefully catch more errors that way. All right, so with it enabled, one of the things we can do is we can say, you know what? This string, we expect it to be null at some point. So you put the question mark after it. So this is saying, yes, this is okay. Notice the null um, had a, a squiggly underneath it. Wait for it, there you go. Where it says converting null literal or possible null value to non-nullable type. That's a warning. Um, it's not actually a, a uh, an error, but saying, hey, you're doing something that you probably aren't expecting to do. You're putting a null value in a string, even though it's, that's allowed because you have not marked string as nullable, then you're saying, I don't expect it to be null. Okay. And that's what this change right here did. Now let's just take this out for a minute. Let's just change it to dis disable. We'll save that. Come back over here and when it catches up, okay, notice that null here and here no longer have a squiggly underneath. It says, hey, you know, that's that's fine. You can put a null value in a string. You can put a null value into person model because that's expected. But now with this flag, let's put it back to enable. It's saying, if you want to put a null in these these reference types, you need to have a question mark saying, yes, this is expected to be nullable. Otherwise, it should not be null ever. All right. And that's what you're, you're telling your code that that's all you're doing is tell your code that. And the benefit here is that your editor will have a better time being able to warn you, hey, there's potential problems here. There's potential issues. So that's what our our um, nullable annotation context does for us 
is it gives us more potential warnings. Now, if you are in an existing project which has hundreds of thousands of lines of code, that could be overwhelming. All of a sudden you have thousands of warnings and that's a lot. And so there are other options for our, our nullable uh, annotation context. So we have enable and disable. And that's this is only for warnings, by the way. So if you change it to enable, you get a thousand warnings, you can still run your application, no problem. But you really wanna clear those warnings out. But in a big project, that could be pretty intense. So we also have the, the option of making some tweaks. So for instance, we can say, let's change this to annotations. And what this allows us to do is it gives us no warnings. So it says, notice there's, there's no issues found. Come back over here. Um, those, those issues are gone. Even if we were to change this, um, it's not going to give us any issues. But what it's saying is that I have the three issues I have are because I've never used these variables. That's why. Um, but there's no issues here with our null. And the reason why is we've said, hey, allow us to annotate using those, those question marks but don't give us the warnings yet. Let us just set things up, okay? So this is what you'd use when you're in the process of converting your application over and you say, hey, let's let us use those question marks, which when you disable, um, then the question marks are kind of superfluous. So if I say disable, then these question marks right here, they get a, they get a warning themselves where it says uh, the annotation for nullable reference type should only be used in code within a nullable annotation context. So it's saying, hey, those don't fit anymore or don't fit because we haven't gotten there yet. This is C-sharp 7.3 and below, okay? Where we don't have the, the question mark for reference types, just for value types. So with changing this to annotations, it allows us to put these question marks in place and warn us about them. But at the same time, if you don't have them everywhere, it's not going to warn us yet about that either. That allows us to slowly migrate our code base over to this point where we're able to, to upgrade um, to the full enable, where we can say, yes, we're using the nullable properly. So we're decorating our code properly so that our code is going to give us the right warnings when we uh, we potentially use something that could be null. All right. So that's annotations. There's also one more state. All right. And that is warnings. Now, what's warnings for? If we come back over here, we'll notice that that question mark right there is lit up. It says, hey, you can't use that question mark. That's not, that's not what it's there for. So you take the question mark out because we're not going to mark our, our reference types as nullable. But it is going to give us warnings when we go to use a potentially null value. So for instance, if I were to say console right line i dot to string, well, that would potentially be a problem because i is null. And so if I were to run this, it's supposed to give me an error. It doesn't always, it doesn't always know correctly what things are null, what things aren't. Of course, in this case, it's my mistake because the nullable int actually does have a two string value. Whoops. But if I were to say S, which is a string, and I say length, that doesn't have. So right here, it gives me a warning, dereference a possible, possibly null reference. So what it's saying is, this is the warning that says, hey, you know what? You're using a, a value that might be null when you're using it. You should probably do a null check first. So this warnings right here doesn't let us put the question marks here. It doesn't let us make those changes yet. But what it does let us do is it gives us the just the warnings in our code where the compiler thinks we might have a null value. 
This allows us, again, to upgrade our project when we have an existing project where we don't want to see all the warnings. We just want to get a picture of how many times do we use variables that might be null that we haven't checked for. And this is going to say, hey, you know, there's, there's a problem here. Um, you, you're potentially using a string that's null. Now it's, it's obvious the string is null because it's right there. But check this out. Let's cut this out. We're gonna put an if statement in here. I'm gonna say if S um, is not null and paste that in there, okay? One of the things you're gonna notice is that there is no warning here. There was a warning when it was out here. In fact, I'll just paste it in here and we'll see that a warning pops up, dereference of a possibly null reference because this is potentially null and you can't say dot length of a null value. But in here, it's not giving us the warning. And why is it not giving us the warning? Because it's smart enough to know, oh, you did a null check and it can't get into the curly braces unless it is not null. Therefore, this is only gonna be hit if it is not null. Therefore, I'm not gonna warn you about that. And so this new system allows us to, to see when things are null and when things aren't potentially. Now there's a lot of ways to trick this because the, uh, the compiler in, in Visual Studio is only so smart. It's very smart, but it's only so smart. And so yes, you can trick it, but there are ways to get around it if we know actually it's not a problem, okay? So we're gonna see how to do that as well. So how do we do that? Well, let's first kind of trick the system. It's not really a tricking the system because um, it, it really could be null still, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna say s equals console.readline. Now, console.readline can give you back a nullable string. So it reads the next characters from the input stream or null if no more lines are available. Now we're gonna give it a value, okay? But this could be null, okay? So I'm not really tricking the system. I'm, it's actually telling me the right thing, which is, hey, S could be null. But let's pretend in this case that, that I'm not tricking the system, that it really, um, that it really isn't going to be null. So what I can do is I can use the null forgiving operator and that is the exclamation point. So after S, I put an exclamation point and I say, hey, no, I know you think this is null, but it's not null. Therefore, go ahead and don't give me a warning for this. That's all this is doing. It's just saying, don't warn me on this. When it comes to your actual compiled code, this goes away. It's not doing anything else. It's just for kind of in design time when you're, you're compiling your application where it figures out if you have warnings or not, that's where it would uh, be last used. And after that, kind of gets tossed. But this tells the compiler, it says, hey, you know, this isn't really um, an ever a null value, okay? And there are times when you know for certain that's not a null value. For one instance is when you have, um, and I just came across this recently as I was uh, teaching a course on API in .NET 6, where you would pass in a, a value that was on the a parameter and you knew for certain that it was not null, but because it's a string, it could be null. And so it's like, well, I'm not sure if it's null or not. And you're like, no, 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 you can't get to this route unless it's not null. Therefore you can say exclamation point and say, you know what? That's never going to be null. So in this case, Let's just run this where it's gonna pop up a box. It's gonna ask us for a value. Let's just put in a test, which is four characters and it says four. So it knows, yep, you're, you're good. Now, if I were to run this and I were to hit enter, it gives me zero character because it does give me an actual string. Um, but this allows me to kind of ignore that warning if I think it's an invalid warning. Now, in, again, in this case, it's not an invalid warning. It actually is valid, all right? 
So that's how to use the null forgiving operator, the exclamation point. You put it right after the variable, right before you do anything else like dot. Now let's look at another option here and let's comment these lines out. And we're gonna look at this person model. So let's do this. Let's say, um, right now it's null. We're gonna say if, and we had, let's just check the length of the name. Now, if I were to say p.name.length, well, that's gonna be a problem because notice it even says right here, cannot implicitly convert, oh yeah, that's a different problem, um, is greater than zero. How about that? So then we're gonna say uh, p.name.length, show it off, okay? But we have to check and see if it's greater than zero first, right? Well, the problem is this is null. So it gives a warning here. It says, hey, you're potentially using a null reference. And if I were to run this right now, it would have an exception. It's a null reference exception, object reference not set to an instance of an object. So it's saying, hey, P is null, therefore you cannot access a property off of a null value. Now, let's just pretend for a minute that I were to say P equals new. Okay, I run it again. And I get an exception again. Object reference not set to an instance of an object. So I have P has a value, but name is null. Therefore, it can't get length off of name. So in order to solve that problem, I'd have to make sure that p.name had a value. And then it would actually run and it would say the length was three, okay? But if I wanna do this right, and let's just get rid of these for now. If I wanna do this right, where I check these things, we have the ability to use what's called the null conditional operator. What that says is I can put a question mark after P and I say, hey, if it's not null, then get the name property. But if it is null, then just short circuit, stop right there and declare this as false. Okay, whatever this, this check is, this is being false. So it's not gonna do the if statement. In fact, we'll do an else here. We're gonna say um, console right line, uh, this was false. All right, and if you run this, no exception, it says this was false. So this says, hey, if it's null, just exit out and go to the else statement because this can't possibly be true because we're whatever comparison we're doing, we're trying to compare against a null value and we can't do that, therefore, it has failed the if check and it stops right there. Now, imagine for a minute, we were to do the P equals new. Well, now P is no longer null. So, but we do know that name is being null. But again, we can put the, the um, null conditional operator after name to check for that as well. And if we were to run this, we get this was false. So this has a value, but this does not, it's still null. So using the, the null conditional operator, we can check to make sure that it has a value before we go to the next step down the line. So we're saying, hey, as long as it's not null, keep going. If it is null, exit out, all right? So that's the null conditional operator. Now, there is another thing here we can play around with. And by the way, uh, before we go on to that, this right here can be written a different way. In fact, let's, let's do that. Let's copy this. I'm gonna put it inside quotes here from it. I'm gonna say, it, um, P is not null and P dot name is not null and p dot name dot length is greater than zero. That's the equivalent. We were checking first to make sure p is not null. And remember with an if statement, if we have these ands here, if the first one evaluates the false, it stops right there, short circuits. And what it does, it says, okay, if it is null, then go to the else. But if it's not null, so we have a true statement for the first thing, then go on to the second thing and see if you have a true statement. 
and it's not null, well, it is null, therefore we short circuit and go to the bottom. But if it's not null, this is true, then we go to this third one and we know that we can say p.name.length because both p and name are not null. So that's what we used to have to do. This is what we do now because of that very easy to use null conditional operator. Okay, so a lot easier to use compared to um, the, the alternative. Now let's talk next about the null coalescing operator. So a null coalescing operator is, let's look at this S right here. Um, let's just say we wanted to have a string. Um, have you used test yet? I don't think so. Um, or T. Let's do string T. So T equals, I want it to equal S, but I don't want it to be null. So I want a default value. If it's all, if S is null, I want to say, hello world. Okay. And that's what the null coalescing operator does is it's going to use this value to put in a T unless this value is null, in which case it's going to use this value. So it's saying that T will never be null this way. So now if I were to do a console right line here and say, um, string interpolation, the value of T is, and we'll do T like so, and that's going to print out T, right? And if I were to run this, it says the value of T is hello world because S was null. But let's just say that we had modified S equal to Tim Corey. I run this again, the value of T is Tim Corey. It never assigned hello world because the fact that S was not null, therefore S went into the value of T as opposed to the hello world if S was null. All right, so that's the null coalescing operator. Now there's one that's very, very similar to the null coalescing operator. Let's, um, boy, we've got a lot of stuff going here. Let's go up to the very top. Let's have a list of int. And we're going to call it, um, I don't know, numbers. And let's say equal null for now. All right, which by the way, this is going to, um, it's going to be a pro potentially a problem because the fact that, let's just check here, we're on warnings, let's make it enabled. This is potentially a problem because the fact that this should not be nullable. So it says right here, converting a null literal or possible null value to a non-nullable type because list is a reference type. So we'd have to say question mark in order to not get to yell at us. Now, imagine for a minute that I wanted to put a value into my list. So I wanna say numbers.add eight. Well, the problem is that numbers may be null here and that's a problem. Now, if I know for certain it's not, I could do this and use this uh, null forgiving operator, but I don't know that because it might be. So what do I do to make sure that it's not null? Well, I can wrap it, let's wrap it in parentheses, okay? Which wouldn't change anything right now, but now I can say if numbers and use a null coalescing, but null coalescing assignment operator two question marks and equal, and then say new. And what this does, it says, hey, if you already have a value here and it's not null, then don't do anything. But if you don't, instantiate it as a new list of int and then add eight. So notice there's no warnings here anymore because this will work. Now, if I were to change the, um, the numbers equals new like that, and say numbers dot add one, that will work as well. So now we have a, we'd have a list with one and eight in it because of the fact that it wouldn't, this wouldn't do anything since it's, it is not null. Therefore it's not going to do this part of the code. All right. So this allows us to do a check in line and assign a value as well. 
So that's the null coalescing assignment operator. I don't seem to use this very often, but I wanted you to see that it's available, all right? So that is the null coalescing assignment operator. We have covered the null conditional operator, the null coalescing operator, and we've talked through these operators right here, okay? The nullable annotation context. But we, we've talked about how we can do enable, disable, but also warnings and annotations. But when you have a massive program, I mean, this is only one or actually two code files, but when you have a massive code file, that can be overwhelming where you get all these warnings where it's saying, hey, you've got a problem here, you've got a problem there, and, and you know all these problems are popping up. Well, what you can do is you can change this to disable or leave it at disable if that's where you're starting from. And there's no warnings, okay? You don't get the warnings from, from this, but you can start to enable it file by file if you want. So at the top of this file, I can say nullable and then say enable. And then if I wanted to, I could come down, you know, for halfway through, I could say nullable, uh, actually instead of disable, I'm gonna say restore. And that would restore it for anything below it. So let's just pretend for a minute that, um, public class uh, address model. Now, I don't like to have more than one class in a file, but this is for demonstration purposes. So if I were to have, you know, string street address, string city, these would all be uh, warnings normally. And if I were to take this out, these are gonna change over to warnings. But if, if I put that in, I'm gonna say, you know what? I'm just gonna address this stuff and not worry about these warnings yet, okay? So that's how you can use these directives. Again, this is only for at compile time. It's not for at, at runtime. This gets stripped out. But this will allow you to start to change over slowly to the, the more full way of working with, with these null values. So there are nine different options when it comes to this nullable, okay? So we've seen enable, which that's the equivalent of saying enable here. We've seen restore, which what that does is it says, whatever you have over here is what you're at now. And then we also have disable, which would be the equivalent of what we have right here, which is disable. So um, that'd be disabling it for just this file. So that's the three directives, but then we have also don't forget about warnings and annotations. So we could say enable or nullable enable warnings and then nullable restore warnings like so. And we can say nullable enable annotations and nullable restore annotations. So this allows us to add warnings or annotations on the end of enable, restore, or disable. All right, so those are our options here when it comes to uh, this, this directive. So there's a lot of stuff when it comes to nullable. And in fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to the very top here, since I wanna recap what we've talked about to make sure that you really understand the different types, not just because you need to know how to use them, which you do, but also because if you know the right name for them, you can Google them. It's a whole lot easier to Google when you know the right name, especially since Microsoft has decided that the question mark character needs to be used in a lot of different contexts. And so you, you're Googling things like C-sharp question mark, and people are like, do you have a problem with C-sharp? And no, I just have a problem knowing what the, C, the question mark means. So let's talk it through. So if I were to say int question mark, that is a, um, a nullable value type. And if I were to say string question mark, that's a nullable reference type. And if I were to say um, id question mark dot to string, 
that is the null conditional operator. All right, now it's not to be confused with the conditional operator. Um, yes, I, how is that the same name? I don't know. But the conditional operator is when you use the question mark, um, let's just say uh, int uh, x equals, um, and they can say, I don't know, one equals zero question mark, one or zero, okay? This right here is the conditional operator. It has nothing to do with null. What this is, is the inline if statement. So there's your, your comparison, which of course that's always gonna be false, but this is says, okay, it's a, this is a, an if statement. There's our true value, colon, there's our false value. So you put the false value into X. So X would be zero because of the fact this is always false. Therefore, it would never hit the true value. But this is a conditional operator that has nothing to do with null. That's not what we're talking about. This right here is the null conditional operator. It's, yes, in some way it's kind of similar because what it's saying it's kind of a, a hidden if statement here. If this is null, then stop right there, return a false. But if it's not null, then go ahead and do this work. Okay, so yes, it's kind of, I kind of I kind of get it, but um, yes, it's confusing too. <laughs> so I wanna make sure I pointed that out as well. So then we have, um, let's just say var v equals i question mark, question mark, zero. This is the null coalescing operator where we're saying, hey, if i is null, then put the value of zero in V, but if it's not null, then put the value of I into V, right? That's the null coalescing operator. And we also have, and let's just make sure we, um, actually, I, can, I guess take this from right here um, as our example. Um, this is the null, um, null coalescing assignment operator. Null coalescing assignment operator. Yeah, it's long name. Um, but what this is, is it not only does a null check, it checks if this is null, then it puts this value into the thing it just checked. All right, that's the difference. Where this one checks the null, but doesn't put this value into I, it puts this value into V. Okay, that's the difference. All right. And then we have, and let's go over here and copy it. Let's turn it back to enable. This right here, this is the nullable annotation context. Okay. And by default, like I said, in C sharp, or I'm sorry, in .NET 5 and below, this is disabled or not present, which is the same. But in, in .NET 6, it's going to be enabled by default for new projects. That does not mean you have to keep it enabled. So if you were to upgrade a project from .NET 5 to .NET 6, it will be disabled because it was not a new project. It was an existing project that got upgraded. Now you can absolutely turn it on, but this is going to um, check to see if it's enabled. If it's enabled, then it's going to do all of our checks. Notice we have our, our warnings here. Um, Non-nullable name must contain non-null value when exiting the constructor. Uh, the annotation for the null reference type can only be used in the code nullable annotation context and the value of and that last one's not part of um, this. So that's, we can ignore that one. Um, so there's two warnings we have right now because of the fact that we've enabled that nullable annotation context. Now, just to be clear on that, there are four values for, uh, for this. And that is enable, disable, warnings, and annotations. Okay, those are the four values you can put inside here.
Now, we also have the ability to use um, our directives. So we have, for example, uh, nullable enable. This is a nullable directive. And we have the options. So we have um, enable, disable, we have um, in it, and we also have restore. We also have enable warnings, disable, well, let's just say enable warnings or enable uh, annotations. And I'm gonna let you fill in the rest here because we don't need to type all those out, but it would be um, disable warnings, disable annotations. It would be restore warnings, restore annotations. And of course, it's all in front of nullable. So it would be uh, hashtag nullable enable warnings, hashtag nullable enable annotations, hashtag nullable disable, and so on for all different, all the nine different options. Now, we're not done yet. We also have, let's just do uh, S exclamation point to string. That is the null forgiving operator. So what that does is it says, hey, I know you think this is null or potentially null, but I know for certain it's not. Therefore, use that to tell a compiler, don't give me a warning for this because I know it's not null. Okay, use that with caution because remember, if you use that incorrectly, it can bite you because it could be null. All right, so um, let me just demonstrate that real quick here because I think it's important. Let's, um, well, I got a lot of stuff going here. Um, let's come up here and just do string test equals null. And I were to say, um, console write line test.length. Okay. And it's going to warn me that that's a problem. All right. So I can't do a length on test, right? It should warn me. Um, yep. Let's hit save here. So there we go. There's no warnings. Uh, dereference of a possibly null reference. Okay. And if I were to run this, that'd be a, well, let's first say, Hey, you know what? I know for sure that's not null. Now I'm lying. It is not, it is null. Let's run this. It gives me an exception. Object reference not set to an instance of an object. It doesn't matter that I told it, no, this is not null because it absolutely is. So if I lie, then I'll get burned. So don't lie, all right? Don't lie and say something is not ever null when it potentially could be. So be, use that very, very carefully. Uh, make sure that you know for a fact that it's not going to be null. All right, so let's, um, I'll leave that in there for you. I'll comment it out because I don't like to have exceptions in my code. Okay, so that's a null forgiving operator. Now we can use this in, not just in our inline code, we can also use it in methods. So for instance, our return types can be marked as nullable. Our parameters can be marked as nullable. We can even mark our, our um, generics as nullable or not nullable. But I tell you what, that gets into a whole lot of um, deeper, more complicated code, okay? Here's what I'll do. I will bring this up. I'm gonna copy this. And I'm gonna give you a, I'm gonna put it in the code. So I'll put it up here. Um, No, with generics, there's the link, okay? Uh, because in, let's look at here, in, um, I'll zoom in a little bit. There we go. So in C Sharp 8.0, you could not use the T question mark for nullable T without it being constrained to a struct or a class. However, in C Sharp 9, that restriction was removed. And then here are the criteria for what 
a unknowable T means, and then it lists the criteria. And then it lists the return values and what that might be and based upon different behaviors and so on. That gets a lot farther in the weeds than I want to go in this video, but I do want to let you know that yes, you can do it. And if you do, you can see what those consequences might be for um, your application. But that way you can be a little more clear as to whether or not that generic can be null. All right, so there's a lot to dive into there. I'll let you read through that on your own. Those rules are there and they're pretty well explained. Um, but I think it's probably better to read those rules when you need to use a generic that's nullable because then you, you can see the practicality of your specific situation rather than trying to uh, have me go over it and then just kind of going in one ear and out the other because you're not using it for a while. So, um, that is how we work with null inside of C-sharp. There's a lot here. There's a lot here. And we didn't even cover the fact that, you know, for instance, in here, um, notice how it's a young about the name. Well, if I use, for instance, uh, Dapper, where I'm pulling this from a database and this model is going to be populated from the database, well, I'm not going to have a constructor because what this really wants is it wants you to create a constructor. And then notice that the warning went way up here and it brought it down here and it says, hey, you must take care of name in this constructor. So name has to equal a value in order for, before we end the constructor, otherwise there's a problem. We, we, it might be a null value. However, if I use this model with Dapper, it instantiates it using the null constru the empty constructor and that doesn't assign a value to name and I don't want to assign an initial value. I don't want to say um, equals, you know, string dot empty because that's not really necessary. I mean, that's, that could be a solution. That could be a solution that works for you. And if that's what you have to do to get the warning to go away, that might be the right thing. Um, but really this is an, this is supposed to be a actual value, not an empty string, an actual value in name. So I'm not a huge fan of that. So what I might do here is say disable. So null will disable and, and say, you know what? Ignore these, ignore them because of the fact that I know that this in a database is, does not allow a null value. So if I'm getting the values from a database, it cannot be null. Therefore, I know this should never be null when I'm getting values from a database. And maybe I have a separate constructor that creates um, this when you're creating the person model. Well, then I would make sure that, you know, it, that it is done properly. But you can go different ways down this path and notice there, there will be times when um, it's a little frustrating when you have warnings that you don't think are valid, but you can wrap them if you want to do something like this, or you can do a string dot empty because that really is kind of valid um, in most cases. It's not for the create statement, but, um, but otherwise it's valid for getting data from the database. So it's up to you how you want to handle it. But while this does add a little bit of pain in some places where it gives us more warnings than we kind of wanted, it also gives us a lot more protection when it comes to doing things like this where, forget the, um, the exclamation point here, but if, if we say test.length, we'd forget about the fact that test could be null, then we can get an exception at runtime. And so by having that warn there saying, hey, you know what? You could be getting exceptions right now. Um, that could be a, a problem in your code. Well, that allows me to go, oh, I need to take care of that and you know do the, um, you know, whatever I want to do, whether it be say null coalescing or what I want to say, um, the, you know, put the question mark after it's like this, the null conditional operator, you know, whatever I want to do, but at least I've now thought through this could be null. And that's what this uh, system allows for. So a nullable annotation context is a good thing. It just takes some getting up to speed and it takes some work to work around these null values. 
Now, uh, the, the person who created the null way back when said that the null was a, a billion dollar mistake. Um, and I can see both sides of that. There are reasons, I think, why null is valid. And there's some that I understand where null is, could not be valid. Um, but whether or not it's valid, whether or not it was a mistake, we have to deal with null. Null is a reality of pretty much every programming language out there. And so this system allows us to put in place some safeguards to make sure that while we're dealing with null, we have the most protection possible. These warnings here pop up to tell us, hey, you could have some issues in your code, okay? So either mark it as nullable, meaning you expect it to be null, or make sure that you put a value in it right away. So this is a good system. And yes, there's a lot of different things to do to work with nulls, but I think it's important to do because it does elevate your game and it makes sure that you have less potential bugs in your code that go to production. All right, so that's how to work with null in C Sharp. I am curious as to how many of these different ways to work with null you were not familiar with. Let me know down in the comments. Let me know which ones you know popped up as as new things to you. For example, the the null forgiving operator that's pretty new. Um, you know, have you used it before? Have you used the different values for um, for your nullable annotation context? You know, not just enable just disable, but also the warnings and annotations. Have you used the inline, um, the the null coalescing assignment operator? Love that name. Um, have you used that? I was curious as to how much you've worked with these different uh, systems and different operators in working with null in C Sharp. I'd love to know. Let me know down in the comments if you have any other questions about null or if you have other scenarios you've run into where you're not quite sure how to deal with null in that scenario. All right, thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.